Super. Cool. Uh, thanks a lot for showing up, even after the long day. I'm really glad that you made it. And I thought um, for today we do a surprise live stream. So thanks a lot for to John for helping us uh, set this up and running live stream. And um, we'll have three talks today. Uh, so uh, I think this will be a lot of fun. Uh, I'll start with an just inputting a fun data set into a Neo4j uh, data science, actually, because I also wanted to show some of the new features in Neo4j Bloom with uh, graph data science. And then Torsten will talk about a SAMSPECT, a tool to uh, na navigate and visualize uh, large uh, graphs in an intuitive way. And then we have a surprise speaker, Michal. I could convince Michal to uh, uh, talk a little bit about his uh, PHP bolt driver that he built from scratch by basically using Wireshark to reverse engineer the, the board protocol of the new versions, which is uh, a lot of uh, fun. So it probably run for 90 minutes uh, uh, all together. So let's see how long it takes and uh, let's get going. So I hope all you f uh, folks at the, on the internet, on the stream have some, some fun as well. Sorry for the late. Uh, heads up, but uh, we weren't sure if we can get all the setup right, and uh, I'm really glad that it worked out. So, um, my colleague and friend Alex and I are running this kind of weekly live stream about discovering fun uh, data sets with ORADB, uh, and we usually pick a random data set. So, we did Kickstarter, uh, Alex also did like uh, uh, Board Game Geek uh, data sets, we did uh, uh, the your wishing song contest data set, lots of lot, lots of fun data sets, and we just pick them, look at the model a little bit, uh, input into Neo 4 j and then see what kind of queries we can ask uh, the data set. And one of them that I really liked was a few weeks ago we did uh, Goodreads uh, as a data set that we imported into Neo 4 j So Goodreads, for those of you that don't know it, is a book review and rating site where a lot of users kind of share which books they read, what they liked at comments, at commentaries, and people can get a lot of uh, good recommendations for, from Goodreads what kind of books um, they should read next. And so we wanted to see, is this something that we can replicate a little bit in Neo4j and, and also do some kind of recommendations on top of that. And uh, so I wrote up the live stream as a, as a blog post and I'll just follow my own blog post because I don't remember all the bits and pieces and it's good when you externalize your brain so the internet takes care of all the memory for you, right? So that you don't have to do it yourself. Um, so uh, the Goodreads uh, site itself uh, is, here's a screenshot of uh, Goodreads but we can also just go to uh, Goodreads and, and basically it shows you the uh, discovery, and then you can look at individual books, you can have an account, and then kind of start collecting uh, the books that you read. And um, fortunately, uh, a lot of the uh, data is available on, on Kaggle, and so what we did is we basically, I just searched Kaggle for Goodreads, and there was a Goodreads data set that was 10,000 books, which I thought, oh, that's a nice size, small data set, so easy to do on a live stream, so let's pick this one. and. Um, so if you look at the uh, actual data uh, as such, uh, it looks like this. Uh, it's basically uh, a bunch of CSV files. Let me make this a little bit bigger so that you, can you see this from back there? So it's a bunch of uh, CSV files. The most obvious ones is uh, books, uh, which have IDs, uh, best book ID, work IDs, titles, authors, uh, publication dates, and, and, and so on. Bunch of ratings, which is basically users rating books, of course, which is one of the main uh, things for Goodreads, and uh, a number of tags. And this is actually something that con uh, confused me a little bit. Looking at many of these tags, uh, you see that it's actually 
a lot of user-generated content, right? So it's random text, so there's no like, not an ontology or category or anything of text, but it's random stuff that people put in with like, whatever, right? Lots of random things. So, um, so I thought actually a text would be like 100 or 200, 300 texts or so that categorize books, but it's like a lot. And uh, so it's like in total uh, 34,000 uh, different texts. And then the, the problem is uh, then the book text file is also gigantic. So it's 16 megabytes of just books to text uh, data. So there's like, I don't know how many columns that these are actually are, that's um, a ton. So what I did is basically I used a tool called XSV to downsample the data a little bit because I didn't want to have all these kind of crappy text in my uh, data, uh, database. And uh, the tool that I use is called XSV, um, uh, which I really like. Um, it's uh, similar, uh, I don't know, a few of you might have used uh, CSV kit in Python before in data science to pre-process and, and clean up CSV code. Um, but XSV is nice, it's written in Rust, it's really fast, and has a bunch of really useful commands as well. So I kind of like it over CSV kit because it's more, uh, um, you know, it's faster and it's also like easier to use. Uh, so it can do like statistics, it can filter, it can slice, it can select columns, uh, render stuff at tables, can split CSV files correctly and all this stuff, including like taking proper care of uh, quotes and quoted fields and multi-line fields and all this other stuff that you don't want to deal with. So from that perspective, it's uh, really nice and it shows you uh, things. So for instance, we can run, let me do this real quick. Uh, so I have like Goodreads books here. I hope you can read this as well. A bunch of CSVs. And for instance, if I do XSV stat, stats on books.csv, it basically gives us for each field, what's the data type, min max values, kind of a bit, bunch of samples uh, for numeric fields, also something like standard deviation and, and, and sum and, and count and, and, and things like that. So that's stuff like this, or you can also do something like uh, XSV, um, I think it's find. And for instance, if you want to look at the, on the title field, as title, and then you can give it a regular expression. So for instance, if I want to give it something with family or something like that, family, oops. Is it search or find? I uh, always mix this up, it's search. So this would be, uh, uh, and then we can do XSV count, and then it gives us like the number of rows. So 51 rows basically of books with family in the title. Right? So it's really easy to get like subsets of data. And so what I did is I just used, uh, I think, um, the text uh, files to look at what are the most frequently used text sorted by the frequency and then kind of cut out these and have now a reduced uh, text file. So if I uh, look at my files, um, I have my text file which is 700 kilobytes and then the Reduced files only 36 kilobytes, and then book text is basically goes from 16 megabytes to the reduced one is only two megs. Basically, it's kind of just down down sampled uh, to a realistic size, right? So, and if you want to go about and uh, use the stuff with Neo4j, I basically uh, wanted to create an uh, DS instance, and I forgot to click on uh, create, of course. Um, what is nice about uh, Aura today uh, is actually that you can download now your credentials as a file, which I really missed uh, uh, for a long time because I always forget to copy the password. And then, uh, so if we look at now the, uh, what's it called? Credentials. Credentials, which file is it? EBA. So here we see basically connection details, uh, username, password, and database name as well. So it basically you can use this as an, as an input file for your applications. For instance, if you have an .end file or uh, an, an uh, GitHub, uh, sorry, an, a Docker image for environment variables, or you want to source it into environment variables, so it's quite nice uh, to keep around and so your password doesn't go get lost anymore. 
So and uh, so it sets up this instance now. I used an ORDS instance because I wanted to have um, uh, Bloomweb data science uh, features enabled. And I want to see if we can, that's something that we didn't do on the stream, so that will be like a first. So we try to do an uh, busy book to book and user to user graph basically that we can try to use as a projection on, on, on top of the data. So let's see how far we get with this. So it's all live, not scripted. I have not prepared a lot, so let's see how this goes. So this uh, is setting up the instance. I hope th this doesn't take too long. And uh, oh, it's already running, nice. Um, much faster than I would have thought. Uh, good, probably I talked enough. So uh, this opens Neo4j Workspace. Neo4j Workspace is the new, new combined UI that brings browser Bloom and uh, data importer together into one UI, which is quite nice. Um, so I'll just log in with the password that I just copied from our from our um, from our end file. And it also opens data importer uh, initially, so it basically looks at if your database is empty, it opens data importer. If it's not empty, you start with, uh, with Bloom to explore your data. And because our database is empty, it opens uh, data importer. So what I now can do is basically, uh, I can add my uh, CSV files. So I have my text, my books, and the ratings. I think that's all that I need. Uploading them. And then I can start modeling my graph. Right, so I basically start with, with a whiteboard here in the middle. And there's nothing here yet, but of course, in my data set, I want to have a book, right? Um, and then I can start either directly mapping my files or I can um, first uh, draw my model. So for instance, I can say a book is uh, tagged with a tag. That's one way where I can basically just uh, draw the mo model first. And uh, then I need to sneak into my blog post, actually, what I did as a model. One second. Uh, the user rated the book, exactly. Um, because the authors are kind of uh, in an ugly format in the, uh, in the CSV, so we extract the authors later on. So that's just what I wanted to check. Okay, and uh, the user rated the book, so we drag out another node for user. And the rated relationship is currently in the wrong direction, so I can cl just click this uh, reversal icon here on the top right, and it reverses it. And so now we can map our files. So we uh, map the books file, uh, this books CSV to the book. We can select our properties from uh, uh, from the CSV, and it's a lot of properties. Uh, we'll probably take them all. Uh, what's kind of weird is that some of these file, uh, some of these uh, columns are. Um, in a wrong format. Uh, so you see, for instance, that, that the ISBN 13 is formatted as an, a floating point number. But that's actually already in the CSV. Don't ask me what's wrong there. And, uh, and also, like, the year is also as a floating point number here, which is kind of also weird, right? So uh, we have a bunch of ratings here, image URL, and so on. So I'll, I'll just take them all. Uh, it doesn't matter. And what we can do is we can change some of the data types. So for instance, we can say um, books count is an integer. Uh, the ISBN is actually also an integer, but it's because it's so weirdly f formatted, we leave it as, an, as a string. Original publication, we can also change to an integer. And so on, so you can basically change things. Uh, average ratings, somewhere there was average rating. This is a float and so on. So I can map this, and then I map the ID, I think it was ID uh, to, uh, as an ID for my book. Um, then we have our text, uh, so the text is the text reduced file, and we select the properties, it's tag ID and tag name um, from the file, and our ID property is tag ID, and then we use book text as the CSV for mapping the, uh, oh see, it's book reads good uh, uh, book ID, it's not actually the ID uh, to tag ID. Uh, so we need to change this to book ID. And uh, for the user, we have our ratings. So there's no, not a separate users file. I think I, there wasn't one, let me just check. 
No. Uh, but what's really nice because uh, the data importer can also work with de denormalized files, so it can basically, if you have a file where the user ID appears 10,000 times, it will just still create one user uh, for those as such. So we have the book ID, user ID, and rating. So we're actually here only interested, interested in our user ID for the user. And then on the rating relationship, uh, we take the same rating CSV file and we map the user ID to book ID and add the rating property from file, which is a floating point, I think, or let's see ratings, no, it's integer. So, and I think I had one thing more. So I have the authors in here, but I think the authors were not correctly mapped on the, oh no, I, I remember. Uh, so we have two options. So I, either we add the authors here, but then we get funny authors that have multiple uh, names. Uh, so that's something that we can do. So we can add, add the authors actually to, from the books file. And uh, it's actually the, somewhere it says authors here. Um, our author and then uh, I think I called it wrote or something like that, right? Is this this? Uh, author wrote, yeah. Uh, so we call this wrote and inverse the relationship and then we use the book CSV again to map a authors to book ID. Okay, and that's our whole model, and now we can run the import and cross fingers for the demigods that it all works and doesn't break. And while this is running, we can actually look at our instance. Um, actually, in workspace, we can actually just go over here to query and, and, and start looking at our data. Because the uh, data importer imports stuff in batches, we should actually already see some data coming in. So we have 56,000 rows imported here, and we can actually also see um, uh, which labels, so we have 10,000 books because it was Kaggle 10K, 2,000 tags, 53,000 users, and 4,600 authors. And uh, if I go over to, it's 57% in, into the import, so we can basically rerun this until it's done. Uh, so I guess it adds more users and, or no, it adds the relationships now uh, because this is only the nodes. And we can also see which relationships it adds by looking at type of R instead. And so we have so far tagged relationships and rated relationships and the road relationships are missing still. So let's see, come on. Yes, of course. Oh, oh, by the way, uh, this is interactive. If you have questions, just ask your questions. Yeah. Um, my question, is this for a one-time import? Let's say I, I, I want to invert the next week, uh, the latest one, and maybe not Yeah, it's a good question. So to repeat the question is, uh, is this data imported tool something that can uh, um, do arbitrary kind of updates, so including deletions and changes and, 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 and uh, modifications, or is this more like an additive tool? So this is definitely an, more an additive tool, so it adds the, the new data, so it won't create duplicate data uh, if uh, data was already in the graph, uh, because um, after, so it ran for two minutes to import the data, um, and basically uh, imported it into batch in, in, in batches. So it uses merge, so it's kind of get or create uh, in the graph data, so if the data's already in the graph, it won't add more to it. Um, and then sets property on the, on the, on the elements. And um, so it doesn't uh, deal with deletions or removals. But one thing that you could do there is basically add uh, update timestamps and basically uh, remove things that have not been updated or... Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so if you look now at our um, statement for relationship types, uh, so we have now 10,000 road relationships, that's kind of the 10,000 authors, 
which is something we need to fix because these authors are not real people, because it's kind of a comma separated list of author names, so we need to fix this. Uh, 80,000 rated relationship and 120,000 of our funny tags, right? So if you want to look at, can you actually read this? I hope, right? So if we uh, want to look at some of our tags, um, um, tag, tag. Let's just return a bunch of tags. Uh, so it's, it's tag name, so we can just return the tag uh, name. So you have something like Dutch and Dutch literature and dysfunctional family literature and dystopian and dystopian new utopian and, and so on. So you see there's not a lot of data quality in this data, right? So there's like 17 different dystopian thingies, right? Um, but because we have the tag relationship, we can also see what are the most frequent tags. So for instance, what we can say is um, books have been tagged um, uh, with this, and so we can actually return t dot uh, tag name, comma count as frequency order by frequency descending, oh, and then limit twenty or so. So you see the the main text is something like. That's also something that I realized in the live stream is uh, basically people mix busy organizational text, for instance, to read, borrowed. Uh, basically uh, bought or owned with actually uh, content tags. So you have like, uh, you know, novels or fiction or, or fan fiction. So that's kind of all mixed. So you see currently reading mixed with, with fiction. So it's kind of an all-in-one uh, ontology to say so. Or there's actually no ontology, it's just random text, right? So, um, so and uh, as, we, as we saw uh, before, there are now, how many, what did we say? How many tags are in here? 2,000 tags, so if we wanted to, we could also remove some of these kind of less frequent tags, but that's also something that we already did in the pre-processing because there were like 100 or 200,000 tags, right, so that we got already rid of. So these ones are actually already quite selective as such, right? But so this is uh, where we can see, okay, what's, uh, what's in here in terms of tags. Um, the, the thing that we need to do is fix the authors because if I look at some of these authors, um, let me do this here. Oops. Uh, or actually, two things. So uh, first, to check what uh, if our data made it into the uh, into the database, we can basically just look at the uh, schema that's now in the database. So we have an author who wrote a book, user who rated the book, and the book uh, tagged with a tag. So the data seems to have made it into the schema as well. And, and now we can actually look at some of the authors. Twenty. Uh, so and you see that uh, here's comma separated list in author names, right? So that's kind of our authors in the source data was comma separated list because they didn't have an extra CSV file, so it's all munched together into one. Uh, so we need to post process this uh, real quick. And I just steal my Cypher query here, but I talk a little bit about it. Um, what we do um, is the following. We find our authors basically wrote a book, so we need, need because we also need the book itself. Uh, we take this author string, split it by comma, space into a list, so then we get a list of, uh, of names. Uh, we unwind this uh, this list of names into rows. So basically, we pivot it from a list into a row. So we have one row each for each author. We get or create the author. So basically, if the author is already in our database, we just uh, merge, just returns this. If it's a new author, it will create this author with, with this name. And then um, we want to make sure that this author that already existed is, is a different node uh, than the new one because if the uh, name was a single element uh, comma separated list, then it's only one name in there, right? So it already existed, so we don't need to recreate it. Um, because if it's a new, uh, if it's a different one, then we need to get rid of the old one, because then uh, it was one of these comma separated ones, right? So if it's if we had to create new nodes, then the old one was a messed up one, so we get rid of this one. As we could also have done this differently, I just realized. Um, so detach delete, deletes a node and its relationship, so it's basically completely gone. And then we create a new relationship between this new author and the book. 
And if I run this, then nothing happens. Why doesn't anything happen? Because I probably... No, no. Uh, did I misspell something? So these are authors. Authors wrote books. Let's see. Yeah, that's 10,000. OK. And author. It's also called author D. Oh, it's all, um, I remember. Uh, the, um, in, the, in the original live stream, I renamed the uh, name actually from authors to author in the import. Uh, that's why it's, uh, that's why it, it's uh, here. And I actually renamed it into author name. Now I remember this as well. Anyway, so we'll, we'll get to it. Um, so if I run this now, it should actually clean up the, this stuff. So it basically now uh, get, goes through these 10,000 books and uh, fetches the authors, creates the new author nodes, and then connects them uh, again to the books. So let's see. And I forgot to create an uh, index on author name. Probably. Ah, OK. It's already done. So now our authors are actually uh, proper authors. Uh, So um, if I now go here to, uh, this is the book. I'm not interested in the book. I wanted to see the. The good ones are the tasks. And yeah, let me just return the authors. I, I'm not. So now each author has only one name left, right? So it's not multi-named authors anymore. So if I click now on one, you see actually that uh, they have written different books individually, right? So it's all good again, right? OK, so we did, we, we did this. And now we could actually look at some of the other questions. So you can basically see which authors have, have written the most books and, 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 and so the, all the classics uh, that you can, we can do, similar to the text. So uh, basically, uh, in this data set, uh, basically in this limited data set, of course, uh, return n dot name comma count as frequency order by frequency descending. So we have like Stephen King with 97 books in here in the 10K even, right? So that was pretty impressive. So I was not aware that Stephen King had, had, had written that many books. But I mean, I knew that a guy like Christie and Terry Pratchett had like 50-ish, but uh, the 97 of Stephen King could be that there are also short stories in there as well. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, so that's kind of the basic uh, graph stuff that you can do. Now, uh, the other thing that's in this data set is also users with ratings. So for instance, if I want to see uh, what do, how would I do uh, like a recommendation? So I can pick a user. Let's find a random user. Uh, or let me see if I had a user in here. This was the author stuff. Oh, no, yeah. Um, the other thing, uh, before we go to, to the ratings, the other thing that's interesting is uh, co-occurrences of, of, of things, right? So if you have stuff that appears frequently in pairs, then these things usually have some kind of relationship, right? So in our case, this, these are, could be tags on books, right? So if books, books are oftentimes tagged with the same stuff, uh, then these tags have something in common, right? So for instance, if I always tag, let's say, a novel with a young adult or something like that, or, uh, then these kind of go together, right? So what we can actually express here is I have a tag, and the book is uh, tagged with this tag, but we're actually not interested in the book anymore because we're just in, interested in these uh, tag co-occurrences, right? So what I, what I can do here is uh, I have tag one and tag two, uh, uh, then we just compute how often they uh, co-occur. So we take the two tags and account as a co-occurrence uh, as frequency, order by frequency descending limit 20 or 50, whatever, return t1 or t dot name comma t2 dot name comma frequency. So this now, oops. <laughs> Uh, it was, oh, sorry, sorry, it was tag name, right? Yeah. 
That's why it's now. Okay. So currently the reading to read is co-occurring, right? So to read and fiction, so this is not so helpful. Let's see if there are some fun ones that are more helpful. Uh, to read and fantasy. Let's, let's exclude these to read ones. Uh, where t dot tag name not in, what do we want to exclude? To read, oh. Uh, we want to not have ones where um, something with read is in the name of the tag. Mm t2.name, so let's see. Because there were some fun ones last time we looked uh, like uh, the uh, YA and young ad adult goes together, mystery and fiction, romance series is also something, right? So uh, usually your romances don't come in a single, but you need to have sequels so you can sell more books, right? That's clear. Uh, then there was also like some dystopian stuff. Uh, Come on. Uh, let's take, oh, I only returned 50. So, uh, let's look at page four. So, there's some more fun stuff. So, audiobook, Kindle, mystery thrillers. You know, so Basically what, what it shows is kind of that in the data there's also kind of some kind of world knowledge, right? So by just looking at this, it's kind of statistical data if you look at this, right? And, and so this also contains some level of, of world knowledge as well. Okay, the other thing is recommendations, right? So if you want to use a site like Goodreads, then the recommendations is what's kind of interesting to us. So one level or one part of recommendations would go via um, things like, sorry. Um, would go via uh, things like uh, same author, same text, and uh, things like that. So for instance, if I have read uh, books, let's say from Stephen King in, in the past, then a content-based recommendation would be, again, re recommend me books from Stephen King that I have not yet read yet, right? And then if you throw text into the mix, then you would say, for instance, like horror or something like that. And if you're interested in horror, then it would add this. So that's kind of the content-based recommendations. Um, and then the other one is co uh, collaborative filtering where you basically look at user ratings. So how did users rate uh, books? And uh, so what I can do here is I have a user. Let's find a user, uh, return uh, u limit 20. And we also want to see how many uh, books they have rated. So we get a user who has actually some uh, level of rating done. Um, as rated uh, table um, order by rated descending and what's it called user ID. So the user, we don't have any kind of demographic information about the, the user, right? So we have only the user ID. So the, the highest number of ratings are like 32-ish, right? So if we pick like one of these random users, we could actually um, look at their ratings. Uh, so return you. Oops. Who sees the spelling mistake? Sometimes I press command space and then uh, it in enters an invisible Invisible space, yeah. Um, so if I expand this user, th these are like the books that they've rated. So uh, what, what is this? Uh, Bill Bryson, neither here nor there. So it, it looks like travel and world and Harry Potter books, Lord of the Rings, so typical little bit of a nerd, right? So, and, and Heidi. So perhaps it's actually, uh, <laughs> perhaps it's a kid. Right? It's not a nerd, but just a kid, okay. Uh, Anyway, so this, is, this would be a user that we want to uh, compute re recommendations for. And this works basically pretty straightforward. What we're interested in is which other users are similar to this user, who is the peer group of this user, right? So who rated similar books in a similar way. So what we do is uh, we look at the rated relationship. 
uh, to, to any kind of books that they rated. We are not actually not really interested in these books. Um, and then we look at other users, basically the peers, uh, that um, have rated similarly. And rating similarly means that the delta between the two ratings is small, right? So you can't just look at highly rated, but you also need to look at what's, what's disliked, right? So stuff that I dislike, the other person should also dislike, otherwise they're not very similar to me, right? So if they love stuff that I hate, then that's not good peer, right? So they need to hate the same stuff that I hate. Uh, so um, that's why we can say it's where absolute of R dot rating uh, minus R2 dot rating should be, because it's 0 to 5, I think, or 1 to 5 should be less than 2, right? So that's kind of the user and their peers, right? Um, so that's kind of the user and a bunch of peers, right? But what we're now interested in is what did these peers actually like that uh, they really enjoyed, right? So we say basically, uh, what did these peers, uh, this is now our third rating. And now we're interested actually in the books. Um, uh, and here we say, actually here we are interested in, the, that in high ratings, right? So we would say rating should be greater than at least, yeah, let's say greater than four, right? So really top books, right? And then what we want to see kind of these books, actually let's, let's call these recommendation. Uh, for these books, uh, we also need to see uh, that the user has not read them themselves yet, right? So otherwise, you have to get the typical Amazon recommendations. You know, you just bought a camera, like John, right? You bought a camera, here's another one, right? So can't have enough cameras. I mean, for, for bikers, I see this actually happen. So we have some colleagues that kind of have like 20 bikes in their basement or so, or they probably have an extra room for all the bikes that they bought. And um, so, so, but in, in general, we want to say, uh, and not exists, um, user rated rated uh, recommendation. So this user has not rated this uh, book yet, so they have not read it yet. You are missing S in X is. Thank you. And uh, what we now want to return is basically the recommendation and how often they occurred, right? So because every peer who has kind of rated this book favorably counts as a plus one, right? So it's basically we're counting how often did this book uh, show up. If it only showed up once versus another book which show, showed up five times, then the, the books which showed up five times is much more likely to be recommended than uh, uh, the, the once. So and then we just return the uh, order by frequency, something that I should probably have a snippet by now, right? Um, descending, of course, right? And then we just return Rico.title. And so for this person who would love Harry Potter, Heidi, um, Bill Bryson, and Lord of the Rings, let's see what kind of recommendations we get. More Harry Potter, you can't have enough Harry Potter. Uh, that's also something really interesting in terms of data quality that I, like word of caution for Goodreads. They put in all the different types of books as different books. So for instance, if you have one Harry Potter one as in a box set and one in the adult edition, one in the ch children edition, they're all different books for them, right? So that's why you get like lots of these kind of things back because it's basically the same book, but they don't group them by ISBN or something like that, or not by like title, but it's um, uh, Lord of the Rings, Time Enough for, uh, Enough for Love, Dune, Messiah, Dune number two, um, this is a sign of every three things and so on, right? So, Hitchhiker's Guide was there as well, yeah, exactly. Number five, right? So, um, so but but you see, basically, with uh, how much is this? Five lines of cipher you can do in recommendation engine, which does collaborative filtering, right? So. Um, which is quite nice, and, and actually the results are pretty good. If you if you would put your own uh, Goodreads user ID in here, you would actually see the, the recommendations are actually pretty good. Of course, you have to filter out some of the data quality uh, things as such, but in general, it's quite nice. So, uh, what's interesting is this peer group here, right? So, because these peers form now uh, basically uh, groups of like-minded people in a way, right? So, what we can do as well is um, we can actually uh, materialize this as um, 
as peers as well, right? So the people who are similar to our user, we want actually uh, to uh, create a like-minded group. So what we can do here is um, uh, see how often did this peer uh, show up. Let's see, I just want to see kind of what's the numbers. Uh, one, 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 one. Is there also peers that show up more than once, twice? Let's do this. Uh, uh, I just want to see if we need to filter out some um, user ID. Sending. So some show up 12 times, so that are very similar people to our user, and then it goes all the way up to down to one. So let's say all the people that show up more, 10 or more times are very close to our user, right? So what we can now do is basically for those people that show up more than uh, 10 times, we actually want to create a relationship for those, right? So we just say where frequency is greater or equal to 10. You can just see for this user how many relationships we get. 13, that's okay. Uh, we would say we create a new relationship between our two users uh, that should call similar uh, to peer. And then uh, we just set uh, S dot weight is uh, basically frequency. Direction. We don't need a direction, good point. Um, because similarity graphs are undirected, right? So if I'm similar to my peer, then the peer is also similar to me. And so merge allows you to leave off the direction of the relationship arrow uh, because it basically says, okay, of course it creates under the hood a, re a directed relationship, but it just checks if there's already a relationship, it doesn't create the opposite direction. So that's kind of the only place where you can leave off the arrow tip in, uh, in Neo4j in create. So yes, you, you learned something. Uh, and then uh, at least something, right? So, uh, and we set this as a floating point. And then let's see, say, um, we just divide it by 20, so we get like a zero to something rating. I don't know what the max frequency is uh, overall. So it created 13 relationships, but of course you want to do this over the whole graph. And actually I don't know how many users we get in here. So we can do call um, in transactions. Um, so that's a new feature in Neo4j 4443. Um, in transactions of 1,000 rows. And uh, so this will iterate, uh, create batch transactions. So every 10,000 users, it takes this block, in a block, and creates a new transaction and executes it in one. Uh, because I don't know how many relationships you get for all users, because it could be cross product, right? So 10,000 square or 70,000 square, I don't know. So we'll just see if this works actually. Uh, and we need to, oh, that's unfortunate. Because the workspace does not support client-side commands yet, so we can't do the auto thing. So it, um, for the unmanaged transactions, so we need to, uh, we have two options. So one option is we just uh, are brave and just try it and see if it blows up or not. That's what we're gonna do, because. Typical software development. <laughs> What's the worst that can happen, right? So, yeah. I mean, what we can do is actually we can see how many uh, it would create and uh, we can be proper, right? So let's see. So it now does a, a global compute across the whole graph. Oh, it's only 1,400, so it's no big deal. So it just creates 1,400 relationships. So one question. Yep. Is there a difference between calling this call in transaction and something like APOC? So, uh, so uh, this call and transaction is meant to replace APOC periodic iterate at some point in the future, right? So, um, but uh, in, uh, the difference is currently it does not support parallel execution, for instance, and and uh, and some other things that APOC still supports. So, in in some versions of near for near for J five, there will be also parallel execution and other things as well. Um, uh, so that we don't need APOC periodic iterate uh, as much anymore. 
Yeah, right. yeah. yeah, me too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I, I wrote it as well. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> but I'm happy that you, that but it's uh, but I'm happy that it's useful. So you see that it created uh, 709 relationships. So it returned a count of 1,400, right? But uh, because we uh, have an undirected one, it created the ones between A and B and B and A only once, so that's why we only get 700 relationships back. But what I actually wanted, wanted to show is now, uh, if we go to Bloom, and we have to just throw away this automatic perspective, and now the Bloom bug kind of hits us where it kind of crashes uh, in workspace. But it's alpha software, so it's, it's okay to still in eval. Uh, anyway, so, come on. There we go. Okay, here now it auto-generated the perspective with authors, books, text, and users. And if you wanted to, we could find stuff by, by um, for instance, tags by tag name. So for instance, if I say tag, tag name, dystopian, it kind of fi finds all our dystopian tags, and then we can select them all and expand all the books. And expand all the books. Why does it not do the right click here? Uh, expand all 309 books. So these are all the dystopian books in, in our um, graph. Let's just set the, not the book ID as an I a title, but the title as a title. So these are our dystopian books here, basically. Watchmen and, 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 and so on, mitosis. Right. So in, in, in Bloom, you can, if you have not used Bloom before, uh, you can do a lot of fun stuff. You can set icons and uh, different, even a bookshelf icon, man. And lots of fun stuff. Uh, uh, you can save cipher queries and make them available as a uh, textual perspective. So for instance, if I wanted to do this kind of thing, give me the books from a tag, then I can actually turn this into a cipher query. But I say add a search phrase and I say uh, tagged uh, books uh, dollar tag and then I would say match t tag uh, tag name dollar tag and then I want to see all the books that have been tagged with this tag. Book, uh, can just return the path. Uh, uh, what did I miss? Oh, is there a save? No, that's weird. It used to, it used to auto save it. That's really weird. You were missing a bracket that goes with it. Okay, let's, let me just do a typing exercise again. Um, tag, tag name, tag, and then uh, tagged uh, book. And you don't need to write a book because we have the path to and pass. Um, data type, so we can actually get su suggestions from the um, data type. We can say label key and say uh, our label is tag and our tag is our tag name. That's quite nice. Uh, so it actually auto suggests. And now it should actually hopefully save this. Hope it doesn't go away. Okay, so let's see if this works. Uh, tag book and then it basically auto proposes stuff, right? So you can basically use 16th century. And then if I hit enter, you don't see much because it's already full, My so I clear the scene again. And if I run this, then it basically runs this statement and then I get uh, my books from the 16th century. Or if I want to do the dystopian thing again, uh, tag book. Well, it only supports selection then, okay. I thought it, that's not so helpful. Okay, uh, that's one thing that you can do with customization. The other thing that you can do with customization, which is new, is this other safe cipher thing is called scene actions, where you can do something with selected nodes. So for instance, 
if I want to add a scene action uh, called uh, authors, just for demonstration, I basically can uh, find uh, the books and uh, the authors that wrote these books um, and return this path again. And I just say where pa, uh, sorry, where b id of my book is in uh, nodes, return path. And then it basically says uh, this kind of do dollar notes uh, thing is something that I get from my selected uh, from my selected uh, data in the graph. So for instance, if I selected my books here now and I right click it and say authors, it should fetch the authors for, for these books. So that's where you can do a, like a little bit of like almost programming type things. You can also set labels, remove labels, or you can take all the selected nodes and group them or connect them to something. And so it's for end users that want to manipulate graph or do some more complex op uh, operations with the graph, it's quite nice. But it, these are all not the things that I actually wanted to show you because actually what we wanted to look at is this kind of similarity. All right, so we have our similar relationship between our users which forms uh, clusters here now, right? So, and if I did not uh, mess up stuff, uh, because you're now running against an uh, ORDS instance, you can actually run an, let's say, Louvain algorithm on, on top of our mini cluster. It's probably a little bit too small, so we need to probably add some more uh, users to it. And we want to do unique colors, and so this ran now in clustering algorithm, and uh, the clustering algorithm identified whatever, 16 clusters here, and uh, uh, highlighted them with colors, so we can also add uh, something uh, like um, page rank on top of that. Oh no, page rank, but uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see, between the centrality or degree centrality, apply the algorithm, and then we do a size scaling, so basically based on the degree of the node, it sizes them differently. So you basically can I uh, use data in the graph as a kind of interactive way of running graph algorithms uh, against this graph. So what it does basically, it takes the data that's on screen, creates a temporary in-memory graph projection for that, runs the algorithm, returns the results, and, and gets it back, right, which quite, is quite nice, and visualizes the results immediately. Exactly. And I think that's mostly the, the things that I wanted to show. Uh, recommendation. Collaborative filtering, yep, and the GDS things as well. So of course you can also whatever Aura did uh, here do yourself in uh, in individual browser with Cypher or with the new uh, Python uh, graph data science client. Uh, so if you go to the documentation page, there's now under graph data science a section called Python client. And the Python client is basically something that wraps the Neo4j APIs in a nice Python API. Um, so you can basically run Cypher and um, return a data frame or basically do graph projections and stuff like that directly from a Python API, which is quite nice. So I could have also done this from a, from a Jupyter Notebook instead. Um, cool, any other questions? So far, if not, we would do the handover to Thorsten, right? No question. Uh, yeah, Jupyter notebooks are uh, supported. Um, you can actually see this here in the Aura DS docs. Um, if you go to the uh, docs for Aura Data Science, then the Connecting to applications in Python has a link. Where's my link? Ah, sorry, ORDB. Uh, connecting to ORDS, connecting with Python. There's a Google Collab notebook uh, as an example that shows the API basically how, how to do it directly. Right. Well, you don't get the nodes, you know. Hmm? You don't get the colorful nodes like in those 
Oh, you want to do the visualization in, in the notebook? Yeah, that's something where you would need to use uh, either one of the JavaScript libraries to visualize it in, uh, in, in Python. I think there's also one integration for Jupyter Notebooks to visualize graphs as well, either for observable or something else, or VisJS. I would need to look it up uh, what, uh, what's the best way of doing that. As such. But basically what you do is basically just return an HTML string from, from a Python function and that's rendered in line in, an, uh, in Jupyter Notebook as, an, as a graph visualization as well. Yep. Okay, cool. So I'll, thanks a lot. I uh, hope this was a little bit useful. We're switching over to Christy. <laughs> Ein Magnet von den Instruments. Nee, du kannst es so lassen, wir können es auch so dran kleben. Ich hoffe, das ist halt. Ja, gerade. Connection here. Here we go. It was muted. Okay. Uh, just. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for showing up in such large numbers at this time of the day. We had so many graph talks, so <laughs> I really appreciate that you're still here and listen to my talk. And my talk is about uh, connecting the dots in large knowledge graphs and such graphs at, yeah, are at many business critical places today. So we have heard a lot of talks today about graphs in, in fraud detection and other, and other domains. And my topic is how can we gain meaningful insight in such graphs, in such diverse and big graphs? How to discover the structure of a larger graph and uh, data flows, for example, without knowing or having any idea of the graph uh, uh, beforehand or any query language skills. Furthermore, at a scale where the simplicity and beauty of node link diagrams turn into clutter and confusion simply because the number of nodes and links is, is too high. And I will show you tooling that uses visual aggregation to browse through large volumes of graph data and to interactively discover the graph from the meta level down to the node details. Okay, some, some Quick words about myself. I'm Thorsten Liebig and affiliated with Derivo. Um, we are developing semantic software tools and to provide consulting on graph-based data modeling since more than 10 years now. Our uh, customers are mainly from the engineering domain, Siemens, Bosch, Scheffler, Festo, and others, but we have also done projects with the publishing industry or the intelligence domain. The background of the team clearly is in knowledge representation and reasoning. 
uh, but the techniques we implement in our projects range from data integration, data cleansing, graph modeling, of course, uh, reasoning, and bringing these technology into, into practice, in, into productive uh, workflows. Uh, and uh, in this context, we can offer three products or technologies, respectively. Um, I just go quickly over them, conclude is an in-memory uh, ontology reasoning system for the very, for, or for the most expressive fragment of the web ontology language. There is GraphScale, which is a technology that adds rule-based reasoning to basically every graph out there. The in, uh, invention behind GraphScale is that it builds in, in kind of a summary graph in memory and uses an, a reasoner to reason about this in memory graph and then propagates back the consequences to the, to the underlying store. And we are reseller of RDFOX. RDFOX is a high performance in memory uh, triple store with a very capable rule engine and, and Sparkle theory engine. And there's SEMSPECT. SEMSPECT is a scalable graph browser, and we will see SEMSPECT uh, in action later uh, in my talk. So many companies have started to build large graphs for various purposes. They often result uh, of merging data from different sources. So the big question is, uh, what's, in, what's in the graph? How to gain insight in such a graph? how to find the interesting patterns, but also the, the local specifics. And well-known graph visualization is often mentioned as a solution to this task. And I'm pretty sure that all of you have experience with this kind of, kind of uh, graph um, visualizations where um, objects in, in the graph and then are then rendered as circles and the relationships rendered as links in between the circles and you typically can add uh, graphs that are connected to already uh, visible graphs. And um, that is good because it's, it's data driven. You never end up with, a, with an empty graph because it's, it's, it's driven by the underlying data. And it's good for small graphs where you, but you basically can see all the connections and distinguish all the connections and nodes with each other, but it, it doesn't really scale for large graphs. And um, that's, oh, the, the cause for this often is that you have poor control over the expansion. We have seen uh, Michael's presentation, Bloom Office, a, lo a lot of filtering methods and methods to write uh, cipher queries that help to, to control the expansion of, of a graph, but typically this is not the case. And if a node has 10,000 neighbors, what do you do? I mean, you can either show just 100, 200, 400, or you show all, but then you typically end up in, in such a hairball of, of nodes. And I typically find it hard to keep orientation with this kind of, of, of renderings because of the heavy rearrangements of, of nodes after an expansion step, often caused by the force feedback algorithms behind those renderings. So um, don't get me wrong, these graphs really have, they are useful in, in, an, in a lot of uh, use cases. So where you really need to see the local network you can also add color as, as Bloom does. Uh, that also helps to, to find which group of nodes connect to each other. Or you, what you can see that there are clusters. You don't know which kind of clusters, but this is something which can be shown with this kind of renderings. But they don't really provide a an, an good understanding of, of, of the graph structure. So therefore, oh yeah. We, we developed um, SEMSPECT, and uh, what I would like to I, I shortly switch into the, to the demo. Beforehand, just, just some words about the data set I'm, I'm using for, for the demo. It's, it's the Panama Papers leak. I just go quickly over this. Um, um, 
journalists around the world received terabyte of, of raw data from different leaks uh, around the world. There were the Panama Papers, Bah Bahamas leak, the, the offshore leaks, and Pandora Papers, and so on and so on. And they were delivered as in different as data in different formats, emails, PDFs, images, uh, and so on. And um, when and they looked into this data and they found typical patterns of 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 um, yeah people using entities to hide their real income and to prevent taxes and so on. So what they the typical pattern is that uh, a, a real a beneficial owner um, starts an entity. This can be done by email with, a, with the help of a service company. And then he receives this kind of uh, um, bureau certificate that uh, grants that those those bureau uh, all ownership of this entity who has this this cert certificate in his hand but the service provider also arranges some kind of nominee uh, owner that appears in all the documents but this nominee owner has to do what the real owner uh, is is asking him to do by by a contract and all this is done by 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 a service provider and this entity now can uh, open a bank account and uh, it can receive and assign uh, payments and the real beneficial owner is, is hidden in all official documents. Okay, so let's make this a little bit more concrete and let's assume we, we are prosecu prosecutors and want to effectively analyze the Panama Papers, a network of offshore companies, their officers and so on, all data gathered from the terabyte of data by uh, journalists around the world. So they really extracted this data by reading into uh, bank account statements, contracts, emails, and so on. So that they identified the, all these, these entities and persons. Um, altogether, a graph of two million nodes and three million relationships. More recently, approximately 100 times the size of the hairball graph I showed you uh, on one of the previous slides. So let's consider we want to investigate the offices that share an address with an entity in Germany. For this, we have to filter the German-based entities first. And I have them here on the slide. I hope you can, can see them. These are the, the green dots here. And then look for the addresses of those entities, which are uh, rendered as, as the addresses are rendered as red dots. So we see that there are enti entities we, which don't have an address and others share an address. And now we would like to see the offices that are related to the addresses, the red dots. And then we end up with something like this. We see, oh, there are, there are clusters. It seems that some of these addresses are shared by many officers, but we don't see the addresses and we don't see how many without constantly zooming in and out and, and taking notes for these addresses and writing this down. So we have developed a tool that tries to solve this problem which is called SAMSPEC, a graph exploration tool that focuses on scalability in data size, expressivity in, in querying options, and a very simple UI. And it, it, SAMSPEC groups notes by their label, and it allows for very selective explorations, and it also aggregates labels, but provides details on notes and relationships on demand and also uh, allows for sophisticated filtering. Find more about the system here at, at this web page. And let me directly switch into the, the demo. Come on, okay. So here we go. Here we have uh, the Panama paper in, in a graph in Neo4j desktop. I have other data in, in this, this graph just for demo purposes. 
and uh, you can use SAMSpec as a, as a graph app within, directly within the Air4J desktop. Yeah, already installed it. You can find it here in, in the graph apps gallery, which is pre-installed in desktop. So just open the, gra the graph app gallery, scroll down, and then install SAMSpec with one click. It's, it's free for, for local graphs. So you can just download the Panama Paper data set and install SAMSpec and, and redo what, what we see today. Um, let me, before we start SAMSpec, just quickly open Neo4j browser. Then we see, which is probably familiar with, probably familiar, here you see that there are these five different labels. Hope you can see it around two million nodes and three million relationships. In SAMSpec, the same data set looks as follows. So when, when it starts, it, in, it uh, initializes and analyzes the database and then comes up with this user interface here where we see exactly the same labels here on, on the left-hand side with these numbers. And what you can do now is just simply drag and drop such a label into this visualization pane here in the middle. And then you see a group that represents these entities. By the way, this is running on my 13-inch MacBook. Everything is, is running here local on my machine. And then you see what we call a group, which is labeled entity because it represents the entities. It is, contains about over 800,000 uh, nodes. We don't show them all. We just, we have a threshold here that what you can, where, we, where you can um, choose the number of, of maximum nodes which are shown in a, in a group. And, uh, but what you can do, this finishes up here, you can look at the details at, at any time. So here we see uh, a list of all the 800,000 entities. If I click on, on one of these, then you see the property details here on, on the right-hand side. And what you can do is you can expand this node. When you approach the group, you see this triangle button appearing here on the right hand side and if you click on this triangle button then you see all the labels which are connected to this group of, of nodes. So entities is connected to addresses, entities, intermediaries, officers and others and when you choose one of these labels then you see the relationships that connect officers to entities. You see the number of, of connected officers and you see the direction of the relationship. And in case the, the relationship, there's a relationship in, in both directions, you can choose either direction or all, and you can also choose to select all relationships. So since we are interested in the addresses of German-based entities, let me just um, select address here. Then we see that all the, the entities are related to 76,000 addresses. And now let's filter the entities. Oh, that was not what I'm wanting. Filter the entities to the German entities. Then we see there are 200 14 entities based in Germany, and when I click on apply filter, this, this restriction is applied to this entity group and restricts this group as well as propagates through the exploration graph. So now we see the 214 entities here on the left-hand side. Some of them are rendered as gray dots. And so these are, these are the nodes in the graph with the details here, if you select them. And some of them are rendered in light gray. These are those entities which don't have an address, which are not related to any group on the right-hand side. 
And on the right hand side, we see the addresses and there are numbers within these nodes which tell you the number of connected nodes on, on the very light, uh, on the left hand side, the group on the left hand side. So what we see is, oh, there's one address, an address in Kiel in Germany, that is related to 21 entities, which is kind of an interesting um, uh, discovery that all those entities share, share this exactly same address in, in Kiel. Okay. So what you can also do is you can, oh yeah, we, we still have to answer our, our, our query. So we are interested in the offices that are related to addresses of entities in Germany. So we can just uh, add another group here on the right hand side and looking for the offices um, that are related to these addresses of entities in Germany. And um, what we could do now, we could also tag these groups uh, with labels in the underlying Neo4j uh, graph database. So we could say, okay, let's give this group a, a label. Say, okay, these are the entities in Germany. But then you have to make your check mark there because you are you are changing your, the underlying data in the Neo4j graph database because these labels are written back into the, into the graph. We can see them in, in Neo4j browser or Bloom, but they are, not, they are labels which are defined by the query you have made in the exploration. So they are kind of dynamic labels. So whenever data changes in, in Neo4j, these labels are recomputed. Yeah, you, you, you can do this. You can look at the, at the relationships here, for instance. Here we have the, kind, the relationship table, so to speak, where, with the nodes of the, of the left, left group and the nodes on the right group and, um, and the relationship details. And you could just download this as a CSV file if you want. The whole data set, yeah. We, we had an, we, we had an um, functionality kind of a reporting kind of thing that uh, exported all these kind of data in, in, in a PDF or a CSV files, but we haven't, haven't that, not, not in this version. Okay, so the last thing I did, I, I created this kind of SEMSPEC label. So here you can find it. It is, it is entity in Germany and it's also listed as a sub-label of entity because it's, it's a, it's, it's partic it consists of particular entities. So we scan the Neo4j database for this kind of label inclusion and show this, this inclusion as a hierarchy in the, in the label. Um, tree here on the left hand side and we could add more labels so these are the addresses of entity in Germany so you can refine your graph model while browsing which uh, is is very helpful to better structure the data and it's also helpful to come up with shorter and more performant uh, cipher queries in the end, because you can also look at the cipher queries of these groups. So let's just select here the, the, the group of offices on the right hand side, and then you see the cipher query that makes up exactly this, this group. And you can copy this cipher query to, for, for other applications, for your dashboard, or whatever you want. Okay, what else can we do? We, we can um, expand the graph from any group you're interested in. 
So you can build up a, a tree, an exploration tree, for instance. And whenever you select uh, one of the groups, then the right-hand side here also shows you predefined labels, which are labels which can be used to filter down this, this, this group you have selected. And what you see here, for instance, all of these are officers, very obviously, because they're, they're officers. Uh, and we could, oh yeah, let, let give this group a name, officer of address of entity in Germany. Then we could see how many of, of those guys here uh, on the right, upper right hand side are contained in, in this group, simply just by hovering over, over this label. And then you see, okay, these, the, the yellow guys here, the yellow officers are those which are also appear in the, in the group over on the right hand side. And you, and you see things like this, oh, there is an officer which is an intermediary at the same time, which, which could be a, a data flaw, could be a data issue, could be intended, but SEMSPECT helps you do, to identify those, those guys. Okay, what else can you do? You, you can do, you can go back and forth, whatever you want, um, with undo and redo buttons. You can save your explorations for, for later usage. So we have customers that, that use SEMSPAC to kind of make this, this predefined explorations to, and check them for any uh, data update to see if there are, are changes. We have customers that use SEMSPEC as a, as a graphical Cypher query builder because you have this, this Cypher query functionality here for each of the groups. And um, we have customers that that use this to, to identify d data flaws, basically, or to export data f f uh, for certain purposes. Any questions at this time, or any interesting query for, for the Panama Papers? Um, the underlying Cypher query for Portisha calls that SEMSPEC is running is it possible to inspect them or see them, what's happening underneath, uh, like the bug? They, they are written to the, to the query log, yeah. When you set the right uh, de debug level, they are all written in, in the query log. We just use, we use plain cipher for all the queries that, that we generate on the fly. Uh, just, just for the initialization, we use some special um, own routines, but it's, it's just plain cipher. And my, my other question would be around uh, data types like, uh, you know, date type and geospatial data types. Do you have any special handling on, on those? Not, not, not yet. That's. Well, that could be interesting as well because the addresses, if they're geolocated, then yeah. there could be some interesting situations that could be a problem as well. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's something we would like to add in the future also to detect whether there are. URLs in, as values in data slots to offer links in, in the detail view and things like that, or images, whatever. Cool. Other questions? Okay, um, other data sets? A anybody interested in tennis? <laughs> So you can easily switch into to other databases uh, when they are in, in your database management system. Here, for instance, we have uh, tennis matches. So could, you could look for, for the matches and look for the, the losers of, of those matches as well as for the winners. And then restrict this, for instance, to, to the finals of the Grand Slam tournaments, 
those are encoded within, start with an F. And when we apply this to, to the matches, then we see, okay, there are players which have won many, many finals, Rafael Nadal, for instance. So he, he won 17 Grand Slam finals and he just lost one. And in comparison to this, Novak Djokovic um, lost 10 and just won five. I, I think this is outdated information, uh, but it, it only contains some of the Grand Slam uh, tournaments, but I think you get the idea. Okay, um, back to my final slide. Um, come on. So, use the right tool for for the right use case, which means whenever you have large data, I would recommend to to use uh, to use SEMSPECT as as a tool to to browse through your data. As as soon as you have a manageable size of of nodes and relationships, uh, Bloom or Neo4j browser or Lincurious or other systems uh, it could, be, could be the right tool. The key factors for visual analytics and large graphs, in at least to my opinion, is it, it should be a data-driven exploration, it should be scalable, and it should be provide you always in, in, in the right overview and, and details on demand. And uh, for SEMSPECT, I have showed you the Neo4j graph app for Neo4j desktop, we also have a server plugin that runs uh, as a plugin for Neo4j enterprise and is uh, delivered to, to the user uh, just as a, as a web page, this, the same way Bloom is, is deployed to users. And we also are working on an RDF version. Um, interestingly, SEMSPECT was originally developed as an RDF graph explorer, but we then skipped our own RDF backend and then concentrated on, on the Cypher version for Neo4j, but we will come up with an RDF version probably by the end of the year. Okay, thank you, any questions? The most challenging part, hmm. good idea to, to, to make it really a, a tool to, that, that seamlessly integrate in, into other uh, systems such as Neo4j in, installing and keeping, keeping book of all, all the logs and, and these things, I would say. Cool. Thank you. Sure. So now a surprise, uh, uh, our surprise speaker is Michel, the author of the, uh, if you want to put it into a if you can just, uh, of the uh, transport level, uh, Bolt driver for PHP, and uh, basically Michel scratched his own itch, basically uh, <laughs> as, su as such. So I'll let him tell the story. Yeah, don't okay. Tell the story. So, but uh, you will stay close because I will need you. I am not used to Apple. Yeah. So he's <laughs> using my computer. So it's a German keyboard as an extra challenge. And, uh, and Mac. And, and Mac as well. Yeah. So. Uh, okay, hello everybody. Uh, let me introduce myself at the beginning. I am Michal Stefaniak. I am uh, from Slovakia. And as uh, Michael Hunger said, I am the author of the PHP driver for Neo4j database, which use the Bolt specification. Uh, probably a lot of people didn't understand what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me explain the basic stuff. Uh, 
the PHP programming language is uh, mostly used uh, for creating websites. Uh, many people, like almost everybody, is visiting the internet websites every day. And I can say most of the websites are made in PHP. And PHP is a server site, it's running on the server, and the product of PHP code is the website you are seeing in your browser. And because this uh, PHP is running on the server, it's really important for the language to communicate with the database and also with the Neo4j database. And just continue. <laughs> okay. Uh, where I was <laughs> to communicate with Neo4j, yeah. <laughs> uh, the communication with database, uh, it can go through different channels. And one of these channels is like socket communication. <laughs> and it's something that goes in binary, it's really low level stuff. <laughs> and uh, to provide this communication, you need some library which understand this binary communication, this low level stuff. And I made this library which communicates in low level with Neo4j database. It communicates with the zero and one, what most people don't understand. <laughs> and maybe uh, some people are asking, uh, what's the story behind all this? Uh, and why I made the PHP driver? What's the purpose or anything? Uh, it's really simple because uh, Neo4j is great database. It's like the best database I ever work with. And the PHP community and also the, like most of the websites on the internet, even the Facebook is written in PHP, which means it's really big area, which is looking forward to use the graph databases. And I also wanted to use graph database in PHP. And I was looking at uh, some options how to do that. And at the first I discovered there, is, there was one driver. Uh, it was uh, deprecated, it wasn't working anymore. And I was looking at some unofficial documentation to this specification and I was like, I can do that. <laughs> it's, it's not that hard. <laughs> it's just some binary communication. And it was crazy because at that time there was no official documentation and all this stuff was really like secret. And I was using a, a, it's Snipper or how, uh, no. Bioshock or? Yeah, but um, the kind of application. Yeah, it's kind of net network traffic monitor. Yeah, it's application for monitoring the network traffic and you read the bytes directly, what's going on through the network. And I was analyzing this data and it was funny because I printed out uh, these papers with all this communication and I was uh, marking with the pencil what is what. And I was just uh, reverse engineering the communication with Neo4j. And this is how I started with PHP driver. It, it was really nice time, <laughs> well spent. <laughs> but these days the documentation is official, is public, and it's easy to use, <laughs> I believe. <laughs> it's not that hard. <laughs> uh, but the result, the final result, is the driver, which is very popular right now. Uh, my driver has 50,000 downloads, which means uh, one download, it can be like one server running on this driver. And you can imagine there's like millions of people going through my driver, millions of people. <laughs> and also we know, I am not sure if I can say it, but uh, the Adobe is, uh, going or already transferring to Neo4j, the cloud services, and they are using the PHP as a main language, which means all Adobe users will be going through my driver. <laughs>
that, that's really cool. They have, I was looking, they have 26 millions of subscribers. <laughs> that's very nice. <coughs> and the final product is uh, something for developers, for programmers. Most of the uh, presentations today were really abstract, were about, or they were about uh, visualizations, all this bloom and uh, I don't remember the name. Sam Speck, okay. Uh, it was really about all this, I feel like abstract stuff. But many times, or many people are going into the development because if you want to create uh, some website and you want to use the Neo4j as a database, you need people who are developers and who are working with the stuff inside of the programming and everything. It's not this abstraction what everybody is presenting. It's something what is really core and it's not possible without it because without the programming, we, we don't have websites. <laughs> and I, re I really like when the stuff are easy, simple, and reusable. And when I was creating this driver, I made it really simple. And it's really like lower level library, which is very nice because it's really fast and it's really, really easy to extend in or implement in your application or website. And also there is one uh, extension, big extension. It's made by one guy called uh, Glenn Nigels. And it's called PHP client. And this PHP client implements my driver for Bolt. Also it implements some other stuff like better connection pooling. If you lost connection, he will reconnect better error handling. He has uh, better uh, connecting to cluster instances. If there is more IPs, he will choose which one to connect. And um, also he has, I don't remember what else does he have there. But it's uh, like. Yeah, integration is definitely in Laravel. And, and Mm, that's by somebody else, I think. No, he's he is he's the author. He's actually updating like the uh, Laravel. Uh, okay, uh, Laravel is a PHP framework which uh, simplifies programming websites for programmers, and he's also maintaining and crea creating a module for this Laravel to easy to easy use the Neo4j. Uh, it's really great solution from the Glen. Uh, we are communicating very narrowly and we are trying to keep uh, the Bolt protocol or the Bolt driver very simple. Because if you want something low level, implement directly into your application with own implementations, this is exactly what you need. Uh, but if you're creating something, um, if you want to create something very fast, like I want to use the Laravel and I just go fast into the final product and everything, you just grab the module from Glenn and just go on and it's simple. It's, it's really good. And I want to show you, <laughs> because I'm always saying it's really simple to use. And I will show you if it's really a simple, <laughs> I will try. It's not, a, it's not my computer, I'm not, not used to, for uh, Apple I'm a Windows user. And also there is a German keyboard. <laughs> and probably Michael will uh, have to help me. And also we are running the uh, code in uh, GitHub workspace. I never used that, <laughs> which will be really challenging. <laughs> and now we will see if it's really easy to use. Uh, we have uh, just, uh, copy of the repository in uh, the GitHub uh, workspace, which means there is a source code of the Bolt driver I made. The, the source code is uh, just the connection class to connect to the database through the socket. Uh, there is a packstream uh, part which uh, carries on the 
packing the data, data into binary and unpacking the data from the binary back into programming language. And there is also one very important part and that's a protocol because uh, the both protocol developed in time, like Neo4j also developed in time. They added some functions like transactions, which is great. <laughs> and the changes are n in need to be implemented also in the Bolt uh, specification. And I made this driver in this way to comprehend all the versions of Neo4j. That means you can use this driver even if you have Neo4j version one, <laughs> which I hope nobody is using anymore. <laughs> it's not. No, it's uh, Neo4j 3 that had both version one. Really? I didn't know. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, uh, that's uh, mostly the core parts of the driver and there is nothing more. And if we want to use it, it's uh, just uh, loading the library. I'm using the auto load file, which uh, loads all the required files. And then I can create an instance of the ball to connect to the uh, database. If we check uh, the GitHub, this one. Uh, uh, I, I will show this and copy this uh, instead of writing because I will have problem with your yeah. science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, do we have a uh, password to some aura? We can just use the uh, demo server. So there are some, actually it's quite quite useful. Um, there's a server running with a lot of different data sets under demo.neo4jlabs.com. Uh, and then uh, basically 7473 is the secure. I need some, any database. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's running and it has public read only uh, access. So everyone can access it basically. So we can, for instance, uh, connect uh, what do you want, movies, database? Mm -hmm. So it's database, username, and password movies uh, oh. to this one. Uh, yeah, but I will need the address yeah, yeah. and... You get the address. Yeah. So this is the address, yeah. So it's uh, all the same, it's movies, username, password, and database, basically. Oh. Right, so you can uh, basically... We put it uh, somewhere in the codes, just below. Put yeah. It, yeah. So this, yeah. and then movies is username, password, and database. It's <laughs> movies. <laughs> okay. <coughs> uh, I will use uh, this. No, FN. Control C or Command C? Command C. <laughs> Command C. <laughs> Command V. Yeah, you did it. <laughs> Great, <laughs> I'm using a Mac. <laughs> uh, and then I need this. Come on. <laughs> I mean, you can also copy everything, right? And then uh, I can probably. Yeah, copy everything and just comment. Yeah, copy everything. That's true. Thanks. Okay, and we will need to use the connection because it's Aura, we need to enable this. Control C. Uh, as you can see, I'm not prepared because I didn't expect I will be presenting, but hof hopefully we can or you can wait for me these few seconds. I don't know what I pressed, but my side <laughs> disappeared. 
uh, no, this. Okay, and now I can write this here. And give me the address. Somewhere here. Okay, and the movies is the. Do I need? Yeah, uh, this should work, I believe. Uh, there is uh, this address. Where I am. Enable uh, Is that free or do you also have to do uh, enable SSL? I enabled SSL with verify peer. Stream socket. No, 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 that doesn't make sense. Uh, I'm correct. And it's uh, our. It's running on SSL, yeah. I mean, as you can see here, it's connected and. Yeah, 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 but. Uh, but you, it's. The movies database, so I don't know if you need to select in the database as well. I, I don't but for think getting so. the connection. I just need a connection because I don't uh, enable a. Oh, maybe uh, the PHP which is running in this instance oh. doesn't have open SSL. Could be. Uh, okay, then we just, <laughs> just pretend it worked. And, uh, so, and uh, the interesting bit is this is kind of the low level uh, driver, right? So, which really does transport level connection. Yeah, I, I will explain what's going on here. Uh, we are creating a low level TCP connection to the database, but the database requires uh, encryption. And probably this instance of environment doesn't have uh, the SSL library, which is required for working encryption. <laughs> And what we see next after we connect successfully, we require the protocol version uh, here, protocol build. And this creates an uh, instance of a protocol, which is the layer which communicates with the database. And the bolt uh, contains like some messages. And with this protocol, you are sending the messages to the database. You are just telling the database, you know, run this query, and you know, give me the result. <laughs> that's the point of the protocol. And that's exactly what we do here. We just say to the database, hello, how are you doing? <laughs> and with this message, we authenticate our user, and the database will usually respond, ah, we are doing good, and you can go on. <laughs> the next uh, message you can run is run, and you are just telling to the database, run this nice Cypher query because I want the data. And the database will respond, uh, the query was run successfully. And you have some statistical data like how many, how much time do you need to run and everything. But you still don't have result, which you want really. You want to know the result. And the next uh, method you call or message is just pull and you are telling the database give me the messages, uh, the records, because I want them. I really want the records because I want to work with my application with all this data. You, I want to process all these people and movies and everything. And, you, and that's the reason why I have uh, the protocol pool mm, into a variable rows, because that's exactly the results you need from the database. And this is everything you need to communicate with the database. There is nothing else. <laughs> yes? I have one question on the PHP side. I'm, I'm not a PHP developer, but um, what is always interesting for the developer side, yeah, I have the connectivity and I get a data structure back. And how can, how, how convenient can I work with a data structure from my programming language? 
Uh, unfortunately, the connection doesn't work because the SSL, but uh, the structure. Uh, I mean, maybe I have some result here. Or no, it's not uh, JSON. Uh, I don't have sample. Uh, the result. Yeah. Did you talk? I'll, I'll try to. Okay. Uh, the PHP have own types. And the result is array of these types. It depends on your data. But also, uh, it's uh, the Neo4j structures. Neo4j have some specific structures, like node, relationship, uh, time. Uh, there is like uh, six different types, uh, structures for time. It's daytime, daytime local, some uh, duration, and some other stuff. And there is also two geospatial structure types. And for this specif specific structure types, uh, you get in Neo4j, uh, in uh, PHP, you will get uh, classes. And this class is immutable and it contains the data from the database. And you can work with uh, these objects directly in PHP. Okay. Also, there is a uh, limitations because you can receive the structures, the specific structures from the Neo4j, but you can't insert all types of structures into Neo4j. For example, you can't insert a uh, node, but you can insert a uh, duration, for example. That means when you are going to run a query into database, you can use as a parameter the object of duration. You don't have to create the duration in query itself. You can just use the object in query. It, it really simplifies the stuff. Mm. It must be something different. Because we see the bugging thing then. Connection refused. There is a connection refused mm. this time. You don't like me. <laughs> so. Yeah. The, the Neo4j is probably too tired of me. <laughs> yeah, I need to, need to wait for the database to start finishing starting up. Yeah, uh, and also uh, not everybody wants to implement this low level stuff. <laughs> and that's the reason why uh, Glenn created the, Neo, uh, the PHP client. But also, I made one uh, class which uh, comprehend the basic stuff you need to work with database. Because as a developer, you, sh you usually just need communication with database, like run query and give me a result. There is everything you need. Sometimes you need like some errors, but usually websites or uh, yeah, really, websites uh, don't care about errors because if website has error, it just returns 500 error to the user. It just shut down everything and the user get 500 or something similar. And that means uh, you don't need to continue running the application when there is an error. You hit the error, you just end. And usually this is everything what people need or the developers because it's really, in the web development, it's trying to be simplified this way. And the communication with the server is usually uh, like trying to be as simple as possible to limit the internet uh, data going through, which means if there is error, just shut down and go on. <laughs> Try it again. <laughs> Does it work or no? Mm, find out for some whatever reason it doesn't like us today. Yeah. Oh, okay. Really tired. Really. I, uh, just opened. Uh, so if you if you're interested in more of this, um, Glenn has also written a bunch of articles how to build applications with PHP and Neo4j and Aura, how to uh, have uh, RESTful APIs and, and so on. So there's also developer pages. 
yes. uh, for PHP, including uh, Michelle's uh, Bolt client as well. And there's a full GitHub organization called Mikuj PHP, which has all the uh, all the clients, but also like Laravel and and, and Symfony integrations and other things as mm -hmm. well. So, for folks that are interested in that, uh, you can see that as well. And oh. I'm really sorry that uh, the Mikuj instance doesn't respond. Yeah. Today. It's <laughs> just too late. I didn't know I will be presenting, and I don't have my computer or anything, and. Mm. Michael is really not a PHP developer. No. <laughs> <laughs> I used to write PHP applications actually a long, long time ago. I there is time out now. Yeah, okay. It's, he, so it's really refusing the connection. Yeah. It's not our mistake. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the last thing I wanted to show is I have it open somewhere. Maybe you close it. No, or no, it's there. Uh, it's on the second to left. Uh, second this one. Yeah. Uh, I was mentioning I wrote this class and this class is just a simplified uh, communication with uh, Neo4j using that Bolt uh, library. And as I said, the programmer usually just need uh, this query. He just wants to run a query, nothing else. And this is exactly what he needs this simple class. It's just few lines of the code covered by the Bolt uh, library and that's all. <laughs> it's really simple. I, I'm trying to make stuff simple. <laughs> I really, uh, really understandable. I believe uh, people who are not into programming understood what I just was trying to explain. <laughs> Hopefully you enjoyed this not prepared uh, speech <laughs> because Michael liked to uh, uh, surprise, you. Yes, surprise me, yeah. <laughs>some unhelp or unlucky uh, experiences with that. So one is uh, we tried to build a Go driver on top of the C driver and the Go community hated us for this. <laughs> and they really didn't like that and, and, and that's why the initial C driver development was kind of paused that we did uh, in, in, the, in the company. Currently we have an inofficial C driver that is currently used as basis of the ODBC driver for NFJ. Uh, but because we've been burned before, we are not really sure if we want to go out and have an like officially supported C driver because, as you can imagine, C drivers are also not the easiest thing to uh, like maintain and, and, and keep, you know, or, or make it as simple to use without shooting yourself into a default. Right? And so, do you really want to have end users using the C driver, or should that be something that's kind of more limited to driver authors who know what they're doing and yeah. such, right? So, and that's why it's kind of a fine line. So we have internally also, uh, my colleague Florent is um, supporting a large group of community driver authors that build uh, drivers for, for PHP, Ruby, and other languages as well. Uh, also Perl and R and, and, and so on. And that group meets like once a quarter, I think, uh, discusses like new, new developments. And so within this group, they know that this kind of internal project exists, uh, but uh, we haven't made like a, cho a decision yet on how we want to continue there. But in principle, it's possible, but there's a lot of like downstream implications of, of doing that as well. So, and because we've been burned like in the Go experiment, uh, <laughs> because the Go people wanted to have a plain Go, everything should be Go, right? So, and I think it would be similar in, in the Rust community, they don't want to have a C driver underneath a Rust driver, so you have to implement it all in, in Rust again, and, and, and for several other languages as well. For something like Python and PHP, and perhaps even Ruby, it's more common to have a C binding underneath. But then it also needs to be 
really easy to build, really easy to install. It needs to be multi-platform because it's C. It needs to be supported on all the platforms on ARM and, and all the environments where people want to run this stuff. So it's, it's not just a simple decision. So there's a lot of downstream maintenance uh, burden on, on that as well. And that's why for, for time being at least there is no publicly available C library as such. Yeah. So security. It's, uh, yeah, it's a lot of, uh, it just causes a lot of kind of downstream work as well. And you have to have the capacity in the driver's team to also be responsive, to work with uh, uh, driver authors to kind of integrate DHC driver, how to manage upgrades and, and all the kinds of things as well. Right? But I can say uh, I am going to say something in favor or <laughs> of Neo4j. Uh, the Neo4j is trying to really support the community because uh, uh, the people who are standing behind all these unofficial drivers, we are members of uh, some uh, internal uh, Slack channel where we can communicate directly with people like Michael and ask question if we have problem with the communication itself, which, which is very, very helpful. And what I was, uh, what you were saying about the C, uh, there is nice thing about PHP. PHP is great language these days because they released uh, upgrades on this uh, language in the last few years and there was great improvements. And they also added one uh, interesting thing into a PHP. Uh, the shortcut is FFY. I don't know exactly what it means. It's something like foreign something interface. I'm not sure. Foreign function interface, yeah. It's something which allows the programming language to run the C++ and C implementations. Which means if uh, in future, hypothetically, uh, the Neo4j will create official C driver, it will be possible to create the FFY for PHP and it will be really simple to maintain and we will be using the uh, official driver directly. That will be interesting. <laughs> and because the, the transfer player library has already a stable API, the downstream dependencies don't, don't have to change. That's also something that's quite. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any other question? <laughs> Then thank you all so much for your time and that you stayed. And it was a really long day, I think, for, for all of us. And um, thank you, Michal, for doing the unprepared and surprise tour as, as well. And uh, if you have more questions, we're still around for a few more minutes. And otherwise, I hope you enjoyed the day and learned something and it was helpful. Otherwise, if you have questions, feel free always to come to our community. So we have community.neo4j.com as discussion forums, uh, but also I just moved out of the picture. It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> and and uh, also Discord server, so if you have questions around Neo4j in any way, uh, our team uh, from developer relations is happy to help everyone. And also if you have feedback or other suggestions, also feel free to bring them on. More than happy to take in any kind of user feedback as well. And with that, I wish you a really nice evening. Uh, if you want to hang out, I'll be around for a little bit, bit longer and uh, see you here around. Otherwise, I think after the summer, we'll also start the meetups more regularly again, uh, so that, for instance, if you want to show one of your projects or ideas or uh, things that you're working on, uh, feel free to also ping me uh, and we can organize uh, something at the Berlin meetup as well. Uh, if you want to present. Right. It doesn't need to be something long, 15 minutes is also a lightning talk. It's also <laughs> so thank you, have a great evening and thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Thanks for showing.